So I'm here to talk about automation and how I came to see the light. So I often get asked why am I in IT, but what I find more interesting is to tell uh, why I got interested into automation. So I started as a traditional Windows, uh, Windows engineer. And as a Windows engineer, there's going to be a lot of clicking around in GUIs. And this is Windows 3.1. It hasn't really changed that much. We have tiles now, but it, it doesn't really make us happy to be clicking around. Uh, the first couple of years in my career, I, uh, I want to say that I enjoyed it, but I didn't really enjoy it. So I started taking my first steps uh, with scripting. And in particular, uh, because I come from the Microsoft world, I did a lot of PowerShell scripting. But I didn't really bring it much into production or into my daily work, because I, at the time I worked a lot with SharePoint. Any of, uh, any of you know, the earlier versions of SharePoint were extremely hard to automate. And uh, we had some deployment skips, but they ended up taking longer than manually clicking to a GUI. So while I kept on scripting in my spare time, uh, I didn't really use it much uh, for my day-to-day -day work. So for me, this really changed when uh, I took a different job. Uh, I took a different job uh, in a different country, because why not? And here I was put on a project to migrate uh, uh, a product from a third party vendor uh, back, to, uh, back to a customer. So uh, it's, it started off quite good, but then we found out that we actually didn't have any vendor support, we didn't have any tooling, uh, and if we wanted to get the data out, we needed to do it manually. Uh, manually meant clicking to a GUI. So at this point, what do you do? Well, you get frustrated, you start screaming, shouting. I was hiding under my desk for a couple of days, but after I recovered from that, we started to look at solutions. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, he was really into clicking, so what he did was he went to it manually. Uh, we, we looked at the speed that was going. We needed more than a dozen people to perform that for even a single site, and we, uh, we had to migrate dozens and dozens of sites, so it wasn't a realistic option. So me and another colleague, he was uh, good at VB scripting, I knew a bit of PowerShell, so we got into uh, looking at what we could automate. But because we also had a day-to-day uh, uh, -day stuff to do, uh, the first thing we did was get rid of uh, all the manual tasks, we, well not all the manual tasks, a lot of the manual tasks uh, we were doing uh, for day-to-day -day work. So once that was automated away, we could start taking a look at uh, how, can we, how can we actually automate what we uh, well, how can we actually automate those migrations? So we started looking at uh, the documentation we could find online. We started looking at online communities, how we could automate this. So uh, after we found the information, uh, after about, it, it took about two or three months, uh, we came up with a solution where we could just do a single click and a single person could perform an entire migration and we didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to do any, any manual work anymore. Uh, so the reason this was possible for us was because uh, what other people shared online. There was a lot of code reuse, copy-paste from Stack Overflow. I think we're all guilty, uh, of, well, guilty of that at some point. Um, and because uh, because of the knowledge shared by other people, we were able to uh, we were able to build our own custom solution and uh, get, uh, automate our uh, automate the boring stuff away and get involved. Uh, get involved with the automation. So my biggest takeaway from uh, my experience on this project was make sure you have the right learning materials when you start. Whether it's a book, a video series, or uh, an in-person training course, uh, I ended up with a lot of technical depth and rewriting and refactoring scripts multiple times because I didn't have the right knowledge at the start. So invest in good training materials when you're going to start uh, with this. Furthermore, uh, the online communities were a big, uh, big benefit for me. Uh, I learned a lot from it, and there's a wealth of information that uh, helped me out uh, to automate all the boring stuff away. When I'm looking at what to automate, I always like to refer to this one. I do like to add a third dimension. How much do I hate a task? Because if it's a one minute task I hate, I automate it, even if it takes me a day to get rid of it. So, uh, I've automated my stuff away. Everything is awesome. Thank you for your time.
Thank you, Sergio. So, um, I'm trying to compress this talk in five minutes. It's a little bit more technical about monitoring, which we were talking yesterday, so let's see how it goes. So, first, hi to everybody. Uh, my name is Antonio. I'm a service reliable engineer at Cloudflare, uh, based here in Singapore, and I'm involved with the Singapore team on uh, our monitoring solutions. So, when we're talk, uh, talking about Today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, monitoring as a scale, as I say, at, at the topic of the presentation. And uh, uh, for us, monitoring uh, is visibility, and visibility is our keys. Um, we have some changes when we scale up our systems. Uh, back in the time, we had 50 servers. We slow, slowly grow, and uh, 100 servers was a huge environment already. So by then, we uh, had uh, Nagios as a monitoring system, which worked great at that point. Uh, it was uh, plenty of documentation out there, and it was working simply as a charm. However, as we keep growing, we start to experience problems. First off, scalability. So uh, we found that Nagios breaks very often. We have a single point of failure. Uh, it's very hard to make changes. So uh, at the end, uh, this was the uh, infrastructure. So we had a centralized Nagios server that basically uh, connects to all the metals and get the data. So you can see the problems here, obviously. Uh, one of the big problems was like, we're talking about a centralized daemon that uh, handled an insane number of connections. Then the configuration file was complex, rigid, very hard to change, uh, and uh, we could not afford that. So we were moving forward and we were looking for solutions. The solutions we were looking for is a, a standby setup, uh, something that was easy to cost customize, and uh, something that can do self-registration and uh, uh, expose servers, uh, services. So we choose Prometheus because it's rob robust, it's HA, it's very easy to troubleshoot, and you can uh, add easily metrics, millions of them, and uh, converting in monitoring points. But of course, the challenge that we faced was first off the philosophies. There are like two different ways to monitor, Nagios versus Prometheus, uh, and both systems need to coexist. So we cannot have downtime on during the, that migration. So that was quite a challenge. Regarding implementation, we use horizontal, horizontal sharding. Uh, the process was verifying first HTTP points, aggregating metrics, defining alert rules, make sure that the rules match with the previous one we had in, defined in Nagios uh, initially. And then uh, once the metric is ready, we deploy it, we verify that uh, it's firing when we wish, and finally we disable the alert in Nagios. And of course, reload the Nagios service and then pry. Um, this is how it looked like now, uh, with infrastructure, so we have one uh, Prometheus uh, server on each pop. Uh, we have two uh, Prometheus servers and living, coexisting by now with the Nagio server as a, a metrics aggregation. So then we have to migrate the alerts one by one. So on Nagios, uh, the alerts are based on the scripts and evaluate one exit code. Uh, even a change on the threshold, it requires basically to modify the whole script. However, in Prometheus, you only need to expose a metric and just change a condition. So that's it. So you, as you can see on the, on the, uh, here on the example. So, um, you, uh, so Prometheus relies on exporters. So exporters expose the data uh, uh, from third-party systems like Nginx, uh, Postgres, or any other database. Blackboard exporter is the most common for HTTP, uh, TCP pros metrics. Uh, the exporters uh, just put available your metric on a HTTP endpoint, then Prometheus will scrap the metric, and finally the, the alert manager will make sure that this alert is triggered in uh, when actually it has to. However, it's not always possible to use uh, uh, exporters, it requires a uh, change on the firewall, deploy an, an additional process, or simply the exporter for that service does not exist. This is actually something uh, common. So we come up with our own solution. So we basically write what we call text, text file exporter, which allows to expose any metrics as long as Prometheus uh, and matches with the Prometheus convention. 
uh, it will run as a cron job and just just put the metric there. Uh, in the future, uh, we have some challenges. We have to make sure that the metrics are not are actually being refreshed properly, and uh, we also need to improve our HA setup. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you, Sergio and DevOps 2017 for, for having us. Uh, we are Koffler, uh, we are hiring, and uh, if you are interested, just uh, approach us. We are the guys with the cloud in here, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. So my name is Jamie Donahue. I work for a, a local company that specializes in in the people side of the business, really. So not so much in the technical side of DevOps, but on the, on the human side, on the education side. Um, I also lecture at NUS as well. So some of you may have seen me there talking on various things. Now, the purpose of my presentation is to talk about a sequence. And uh, here's a very famous sequence back from 2009, a Simon Sinek talk uh, on his golden circle. Great leaders start with why. Um, and uh, in IT, we also have a sequence, right? We've been talking about people, process, and technology aspects of services for many years, but it may not have been clear to everyone that it, the sequence, people, process, technology, actually matters. So if you start with technology first, which is the easiest way, of course, you go out and buy something shiny. There's lots of shiny salesmen who are willing to sell you something tell you that best practices are integrated, you don't need to think about it, you don't need to train your people, right? It's so easy to use, you just buy it and go. But if you take that approach, you end up in these constant tech refreshes, you keep uh, investing in new systems, you're not quite sure what was wrong with the old one, and when it comes to value, you don't even think about it. That's a business case, right? For the business, not for IT. So maybe we start with processes, we have some kind of Hierarchy, goals cascade, this is uh, from COVID, IT governance, has a clear line of sight between you know, the people on the ground and the strategy at the top, so everyone knows what they're doing. But in reality, we end up with too much documentation, we end up with uh, maturity assessments with you know, pretty graphs, but nobody's quite sure what it means, and a document repository that never ends. So. Why don't we start with people instead? And of course, that means training, right? Send one guy for a training course, can't send everybody because we know we've got a team to run. So that one person will go spend three days of training, come back, they're a master, they can train the rest of the company, right? We don't give them any authority, of course, so when they come back, they can't actually use it. And within a week, they've forgotten everything that they've learned, almost, maybe 20% distant memory. So now we're a bit stuck. We've been through all three sequences. We were supposed to have people process technology. We're supposed to be the right one. But what we often get wrong is it's people process technology, not person process technology. You can't train one person, you can't change one person. But what stops us from talking to the people, to all the stakeholders? Well, they have too many questions for one. And some of those can be negative, dealing with human resistance to change. So you think, why bother? Let's just speak to the director, they're in charge. I mean, all we want is high performing teams, right? We're not going to co-locate the teams, we're going to have them dotted all around the world, never train together, never give them a coach, but we still want them to score goals at the end of the day. And we, speed is good, but we still need efficiency as well. So you're still going to have to work on two projects, three projects, four projects. Right? Never heard of context switching, don't know what that is. So we'll just ignore that one. But we need to change. Right? We need to change what it is that we do. We need to invite everybody. We need to understand who. Only once we know who can we ask the why question to the right people. So who is dev? Who is ops? Right? It's not just a developer. It's not just a sysadmin. Once we've got everyone together, we can think about why. And we might realize that DevOps isn't what we need right now. It might be something else. Right? But if DevOps is what we need, then we should train everybody. Everybody should be at the same level of understanding. We can't rely on one person or two people. And when we do train someone, give people the, the chance to use it. So as soon as they finish that training, they can actually use it straight away on day one so they don't forget. And once everyone is at the same level of understanding, we can think about how we want to work. These are all the different DevOps models I could find just on one website. 
Right, so what is DevOps? It can be anything. Now, once we know what we want to do, why we want to do it, how we want to work, then we can look at tools. You know, if you go to the, the market without a clear lens on what it is that you want, you can easily get lost in this periodic table of technology. But now we know how we want to work. So in summary, technology first, we can become a slave to the tool. People first, we get lost in best practices without really understanding why we're doing it. People first, we work how we want to, and we get the real value because we understood what that is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Pradeep. I'm working for Palo IT as DevOps lead. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to talk about metal as a service and uh, how we can actually turn the data centers and make them as uh, smart data centers and then deploy big softwares like OpenStack or Kubernetes or something. Um, so uh, basically I'm going to talk about mouse as a tool um, uh, and then OpenStack deployment, just an example. It can be anything, it can be Kubernetes or something. And uh, I'm going to talk about Juju Charms a bit, and, and then Ceph is basically the distributed storage system that we're, we're actually using. So, uh, how many of you really work with Metal? No, I know. <laughs> I know it's, uh, you know, we don't get our opportunity to work with Metal, but we always, our workloads are ended up in running on a bare metal physical servers, right? So, it's quite hard to deal with physical servers, that's why we offload the work to somebody else. Um, it's complex, you know, it's uh, difficult to have, uh, you know, uh, achieve agility and uh, manual deployments are quite complex. But the good news is there's an open source tool available that actually does the job and we tried, with, uh, we tried it and it, it's great. Um, it's a metal as a service, it's, it treats the physical servers as, as a virtual machines and adds elasticity to it and it's a provisioning contract, uh, construct created by um, Canonical guys. So one of the use cases, uh, if you automate to the extent, you know, where you can deploy op Windows on the same rack in the morning and use your employees, and then in the night, you know, you re redeploy in, uh, a Linux platform and then use for high performance com computing like batch processing and all. So that's going to be cool, right? And that's what Metal, can, uh, Metal as a Service can do. It can also install, of course, configure, monitor your, um, you know, physical servers and, uh, you know, firmware upgrades and so forth. It can do redeploy and so forth. So basically the architecture is simple. It's um, a REST API with a web interface um, and then and a region D which actually has a DNS service in, embedded in it and then RAC D which has all the PXC booting, uh, TFTP and all other underlying infrastructure services. So how I've implemented this one is simple. Have a mass a server and then connect it to two switches, internal and external and then you configure your nodes with one port to operate the power and then the rest of the ones to connect to the servers. So once you actually uh, switch on these servers and mass will know, okay, yeah, I, I know you, there's a new machine. And then mass adds, to its, uh, adds it to the cloud and mass can expose its API to, to controllers like Chef, Juju controller, for example, or any of the configuration management tools and where we can actually deploy. So for example, I'm talking about OpenStack deployment, how I made OpenStack deployment easy. We're using it extensively in Palo IT. Uh, you know, I think most people know OpenStack. It, uh, it's an open uh, source uh, cloud platform. Uh, you know, it can turn your hypervisors into, you know, data centers. It supports various hypervisors, KVM to, you know, Hyper-V. Uh, one of the recent surveys of the OpenStack says that, you know, people are going for OpenStack. Some people, well, at least they say that they want to avoid vendor locking. That's why they choose OpenStack. And the other one is, uh, keep, uh, other factor is innovation. So they want to innovate with OpenStack. So, um, but the, the problem with OpenStack is, is quite big software, um, you know, various components, the core services are listed here, uh, Nova, you know, Keystone, Neutron, Glance, but there are so many other services like Load Balancer as a service, Tro and, um, you, you know, Database as a service and so forth. So it's quite difficult to deploy and scale and, and so forth. Um, and also, you know, if you want to upgrade and, you know, integration with various physical hardware, this is quite challenging. But with actually Metal as a service, integrated with Juju Charms is quite, um, you know, we made it, uh, it made our, our job easy. At least when I'm working on the data center, it uh, made my job so easy. So how it works is Juju Charms basically is a reactive program metal, uh, method where actually you uh, design a model and then deploy that model 
into the uh, into your physical bare metal in structure or anything so here as you see in the picture um, Juju is basically picking a charm a open stack charm and then it's deploying on the bare metal uh, using metal as a service so it's for me open stack deployment is all about drag and drop because I'm using this Juju um, you know base and we also have uh, you know several other Kubernetes and uh, Spark cluster, Hadoop cluster for deployment. We, we have these uh, charms as well. It's open source, it's free to use. Uh, beneath that, the, the deployment that I'm using is, uh, you know, has uh, having a, uh, um, Ceph is a storage that's basically highly scalable, uh, you know, distributed storage solution, avoids single point of failure, you know, has self healing embedded within it. So um, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, I, I wish you all, uh, you know, you also do some automation, uh, play around with physical servers if you get opportunity like me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fessel, and I also work for Palo IT. Um, I'm going to be talking about Virtual Essay, which is a chat bot to do provisioning on the cloud. And it also installs software packages that you might need. I would like to share why we did Virtual Essay, how we did it, the technology stack that we used, and um, I would also like to share our experience in general. Right? So at Palo IT, we focus a lot on learning and innovation. One of the main goals with Virtual SA was to let our developers provision machines or development environments as soon as possible so they can focus on uh, innovating and delivering software which adds business value as quickly as possible. We did it uh, over a weekend where um, some of us got together uh, basically to learn more about chatbots, machine learning, and provisioning. The idea was to learn in a collaborative way where we're, sh where, where we're sharing, uh, sorry, where we're sharing with each other and everybody gets to learn based on their own interests. Um, with the bot, we can now set up an environment for a specific project in under four minutes. You need a development environment for a new application in React. That's not a problem at all. You just ask the bot and it's done. The machines can be provisioned on OpenStack. They can be on Google Cloud, AWS, Alibaba Cloud. You could even integrate it with Kubernetes or Docker. Docker. We use Slack for internal communications, but we explored Facebook Messenger, uh, Skype a little bit, and uh, Telegram. And we even did a mobile application uh, in React Native uh, with ClojureScript. In terms of design, uh, the virtual essay has three components, the bot, machine learning, and provisioning. The bot is essentially a Node.js web server, which is talking to MongoDB. Uh, the different channels talk to the same bot so that you get a, a seamless experience across the different channels. Uh, to make it more seamless in terms of the interaction with users, we use something called Dialogflow. It's basically a natural language processing API from Google. And um, it has built-in fallback responses and it does learn over time, so that was definitely a win. We felt that it would be interesting in the future to augment this with uh, project-specific uh, synonyms. So for now, basically, we just use different key uh, we just match different keywords if the, uh, to the same underlying package if they're synonymous to each other. For example, Java, Java 8, or JDK would all be mapped to JDK 8. On the machine learning side, this is an interesting one, we tried to build a model to predict if a machine that was being requisitioned would be used effectively or not. Uh, we did not have a lot of luck on this front because at that point, we did not have a lot of data. We definitely need to go revisit that uh, soon. The third component, the last one, and the most interesting one, I think, for, uh, for the audience today, is basically provisioning. And the way we did it is a REST API using Node.js. Uh, which, is talking to, uh, which is talking to Ansible and Terraform. Yeah, it's a single Ansible playbook that we use with different roles that you need to set up, and it's, it does everything uh, in, in one single step where it basically sets up the infrastructure that's required. The bot also has integration with Ansible Galaxy, which is a public repository of various Ansible roles. This enables the users to install packages that the bot has never even heard of in the past, which is quite interesting. Uh, I would now move on to how we could improve virtual essay in the future. A few key things would be to 
uh, identify the same user across the different platforms. This can be done by building a user profile with their mobile numbers and Slack IDs, for example. NLP could be improved further to battle handle like project, package, and operating system names. We could curate more Ansible roles based on the common requests that we get, as not all roles on the Ansible Galaxy work out of the box. That's something that we, we, we struggled with a little bit. Uh, having this curated set of roles basically ensures that installation would work in the first, uh, in the first step. We would definitely want to work more on machine learning. Uh, for example, one of the things that we want to do is to make suggestions for better machine configurations based on the project that you're doing. Uh, that's all the time that I would take today. Um, I've been told to plug this in, so I'm going to do that. Uh, we have limited edition t-shirts, so come visit us at the booth. We would like to get your comments and feedback. And that's it. Thank you so much, guys.